like to thank Alison for that very um, generous introduction and to the organizers um, for inviting me. I'm not sure I can answer um, all the questions or even any of the questions. Um, but in true academic standard, I think I'll give you a good analysis of what's wrong, and then it's up to you to try and work out what we do about it. Um, so what I want to do with this talk is to really take a step back and look at the psychology of self-care or self-medication. Saying self-medication because I know you have a particular interest in uh, medicines, but I think much of this will also apply to self-care. And I think what we have to recognize um, is that actually there's a gap between effective treatments or guidelines for good self-care and optimum outcomes. And behavior is one of the rate limiting steps. It's the behavior of clinicians, prescribers, pharmacists, and the behavior of patients in terms of what people do, whether they adhere to the advice. And um, I think this cartoon represents where we are with that. We've put all our effort into getting the right treatments recognized, getting the guidelines written, and then relatively little into examining how they're actually used and implemented in practice and why they're often not used uh, optimally. And so this lecture really is, is looking at that sort of last gap. Um, what I think we need is to have a global theory that we apply to local solutions. So can we say something in general about where this goes wrong? in understanding what people bring to an illness and a treatment encounter, how we can understand that and then do things better. Okay, well the first insight I think is that it's clear that providing instructions and information is not enough to change people's behavior. And this is a really important first lesson in healthcare because we make this mistake all of the time. And of course the reason it doesn't work like that is information and knowledge are essential uh, in order to be able to do something, but they're not the whole picture. It does, doesn't guarantee that you'll actually do it. In order to make us do something, information has to do one of two things. It either has to agree with our existing beliefs about that illness or about that treatment or about self-care, about receiving a prescription for an antibiotic. We come with beliefs about how you treat sore throat or it has to change them, okay? Now, if you need any convincing of this, let's do a little thought experiment. How many of you got up this morning and looked at your astrological stars before coming to the conference? Well, we're in Chi-Chi, Windsor, so I'd say about 50% of you, okay? <laughs> so um, I want to now change that by giving you this extremely good quality information about astrology. And it's written, it's better than anything you'll ever get in the NHS in terms of quality and, and you know, how well it's presented. And it's written by the UK, possibly the world's greatest astrologer, Russell. Now, you have two sets of beliefs, don't you? One is about astrology and one is about the messenger. And we often think that if we put the right messenger in, someone who's influential, like the doctor, possibly the pharmacist, that the message will get through. But that's not necessarily the case because the message usually trumps the messenger. And you can tell this by, even if, let's take someone whose opinion we trust, Alison, for example, even if we replaced um, Russell with Alison's picture, still wouldn't make you change your behavior. You'd think again, but you probably wouldn't do it, okay? So we have to understand what the person brings. They have a set of values, beliefs, and expectations that they bring to the encounter with this condition and with the treatment and what we are advising them to do. And this is a, a sort of simple model. I spent about 20 years trying to work out why patients don't take uh, medicines, and I finally reached the answer. And it's um, because they can't or they don't want to. There you go. <laughs> but of course, um, being an academic, I can't make a career on that, so I have to make it a little bit more complex. So this is an attempt, the beginning of an attempt to do that, and it's called the perceptions and practicalities approach. But actually from that insight, what we really need to understand is there are two behaviors here. Failure to follow advice, like taking a medication or adopting a self-care procedure, can be, it's two related behaviors. It can be unintentional, the person wants to, but they can't, okay? Or it can be intentional, the result of a decision. Unintentional is a limitation in capacity and resources. People forget, 
they haven't got enough information, they can't afford to do what we're asking them to do. These reduce the person's ability to implement the advice and their practical barriers. They require particular types of solutions, don't they? But actually, a lot of the reason why people don't do what we want them to do is intentional. Now, I'm not saying that intentional is a decision where people work it out and go, I'm definitely not doing that. Often, the decision is implicit. It just doesn't make sense to us, so we don't do it. And to understand that, we need to look in a different place, which is the factors that influence people's motivation to start and continue with a recommended treatment or option. And there we need to understand values and beliefs, and these form perceptual barriers. So it follows that for any bit of advice that we give someone, they may have no barriers or a mix of perceptual and practical barriers. What we ought to do in every care encounter is to identify for that individual the type of barriers that they've got, and then take interventions off the shelf to address them. The NICE guidelines for medical uh, medicines adherence basically recommend but it's easier said than done, isn't it? And we absolutely don't do it in practice. And part of the reason is, as soon as you start mentioning beliefs, people think I'm going to s invite the patient to lie on the couch and tell me about their childhood or whatever in the pharmacy. So people switch off. We can't do that. We're too busy. It's too complicated. It's too difficult. But actually what I'm talking about is not psychology. You don't need psychologists to do this. This is part and parcel and integral for what is good medicine, and I would argue also good pharmacy. And it begins with the need to understand what people bring to an encounter with a medicine. We know that, well, WHO estimates that 50% of medicines prescribed for long-term conditions are not taken as directed. And if we take a leap of faith and imagine that those prescriptions were appropriate, that's a massive global loss to individuals and society. What's going on there? How can we understand what people are bringing, how they think about medicine? So a lot of the work that um, I've been doing while you've all been enjoying yourselves is to look at, can we define a simple framework that practitioners can use to begin to understand what uh, patients will bring or what uh, customers will bring to an encounter with a, a medicine, be it prescribed or offered as an OTC? And can we find a framework that works across conditions and across countries, social demographic differences? So a lot of the stuff I've been up to is doing this. Um, you know, you could develop the beliefful scope. We now look at the beliefs uh, on the surface of the patient's brain. And if we find anything that's negative or means that they won't follow our advice, we just press a little button. It gives a small lobotomy in that area and everything's fine. But um, the problem is the NHS wouldn't invest in it. So we have to develop a boring questionnaire. And this is um, cunningly titled the Beliefs About Medicines Questionnaire. And you can guess what it does. And it's very brief. You can fill it out in like three minutes. But it provides an indication, not about all the beliefs that are important, but the key ones that influence people's decisions. And there are two types of beliefs. What you think about the particular prescription. Um, Neurofen versus ibuprofen, for example. Okay, so what you might think about that. How do I decide whether I want to start and continue with it? What's going on in my head? And then more general beliefs that are social representations of pharmaceuticals as a class of treatment. Often people bag pharmaceuticals together and see them differently as other treatments. How many of you would agree with the following statement? Medicines do more harm than good. Surprisingly, no one. But 25% of the UK pop samples that we've looked at who are on medication would tick, agree, or strongly agree with that. If doctors had more time, they would prescribe fewer medicines. 45%. These are examples of items referring to medicines in general, okay? But I'll maybe come back to that later and just focus on the specific beliefs. And this is the simple framework. This is research now. We just submitted uh, a meta-analysis of um, 44 studies looking at this simple framework as an explanatory framework for why people don't take medication. And it comes out very strongly, as I'll show you. But it's basically two evaluations that we make. Firstly, we ask ourselves, how much do I need this to maintain my health now and in the future? And what can I get away without? 
can I get away without talking it? And the answers to those two questions are necessity belief. It's not the same as believing the treatment is effective or that it has benefits. It's how much do I need that benefit and how much do I need that efficacy? And we form an evaluation. And then we judge that relative to our concerns about what could go wrong, potential adverse effects. Now, often these judgments, unfortunately, people don't use my questionnaire every day to work this out. It's in the background. They don't even recognize they're doing it. But you have an implicit idea about necessity. So the people who want an antibiotic, their perception of necessity is high. I need an antibiotic. Okay? And we judge necessity against concerns. This is just some examples. So you can put a number to this using the DMT. And it's just some frequencies from conditions where taking a medication regularly is essential. These are all patients on drugs. If you score five, it means you're in agreement with the practitioner. I really need to use this medication. If you score less than five, it's a doubt with doubt increasing as the numbers get smaller. And what this is showing is that there's quite a lot of doubt, isn't there? It's low, it's positively skewed. The other thing is these doubts are not declared. They're in the background. They don't come out in the consultation, but they, they're in the background. And also when we look at concerns in the same samples, over a third of people have strong concerns about the medication. Again, hidden and undeclared. And these are some examples of course. I don't think we've really got time for this. Have I, am I strictly being held to time here? Okay, I'm going to just give you one example. People, these are just quotes that you can glance through where people, uh, you know, express concern about the hidden effects of medicines. And these um, beliefs really do um, affect people's willingness to start and continue with treatment as a, a recent meta-analysis has shown. Okay? Um, also, this framework... Um, explains people's um, intention to take over-the-counter treatments in one study. Very few studies of uh, why people take or don't take over-the-counter treatments, but this is one where that framework works. But uh, the other thing that Carmel Hughes has shown is that often um, perceived efficacy and safety and brand familiarity are really important choices in OTC medication. And there's a certain sort of conservative, I think the last speaker mentioned this, often people are very conservative about OCT, so they go in with an expectation of what works for them. And this study seems to indicate that past experience is what really influences that. So it's almost like people self-select before they go in. And there's a, an, an they're not generally very aware that the pharmacist can prescribe quite a wide lexicon of OTC products. So it's rather like thinking you're buying a bar of chocolate, I tend to like Cadbury's, that's what I'm gonna buy. Whereas there's obviously now a whole world um, of additional options that are out there. Um, we don't need to show that. I don't think I need to show this really. It's getting a bit too technical. Okay, so where do these ideas come from? Why would someone doubt that they need the treatment when someone who they trust is telling them that they do? Well. We tend to question advice, even if it comes from trusted practitioners. We evaluate whether that advice makes common sense to us in the light of our own beliefs about the illness and treatment. So what's really influential about self-care is what we think about illness. And we have a good understanding now about the psychology of illness, and we tend to to ask ourselves five questions to build a model. If someone gives us a diagnosis or we have a symptom, we ask five questions that help us to make sense of it, but also to determine what we do about it. And the five questions are, what is it? Now, this is important because if you give me a label, like you have hypertension, the immediate thing I start to do is to try and find symptoms that go with it. And if there aren't, the label lacks salience. How can I be ill? I'm not feeling like this. Likewise, if I've got symptoms like a sore throat and you tell me it's okay, there's nothing wrong, you don't need the treatment, just go away, that's not very reassuring or salient because my whole experience is if I've got symptoms, I've got a condition, the doctor hasn't found it. Do we go and consult with someone else? You ask yourself what caused it. 
how long will it last? And what will happen to me as a result of this or others? And then what will make it better? And the answer to those questions have to make sense to you. So if you think that your hypertension is caused by high tension, the logical treatment would be to relax, have a cigarette, calm down, not take a medication which is nasty. So you need to have a common sense coherence to the idea. And often people's ideas that they build are completely logical, but completely at odds with the medical model. And we never give people information about diseases using this model, yet there's very good evidence from a whole range of studies that that's how we think about illnesses. So one of the things we ought to do is to start communicating illnesses using this implicit psychological model. And this is how it works. So I'll give you an example. We, this is how we self-care, okay? So let's consider a health threat. How many people are staying for dinner tonight? Okay, so you wake up tomorrow morning and you lift your head off the pillow and you have a strange headache and you feel slightly nauseous. What do you think is wrong? Okay, I'm, I ring you at just that moment and say, I think you should go for a brain scan. <laughs> now that advice, although very good, doesn't make common sense, does it? Because your representation of it is this may be a hangover. If you've never had one, you know people who have, okay? And you're thinking it's a hangover, and it's got a timeline, okay? And you know how long it'll last, etc. cetera. Um, and then your action that you use to, co to cope with it will differ. Some people will drink water, some people just stay in bed longer, etc. And then you appraise that action, did it work, okay? Now, if, if you wake up on the next four days with the same symptoms, and presumably you haven't uh, indulged in the interim period, you're starting to now question whether the representation is right. So you're starting to think maybe the idea of going for a scan is not so strange because your ideas about the condition are starting to change. But you still don't necessarily go for the scan because you also have an emotional response to the idea which is fear. What if they find something really nasty? And that causes you to delay a bit longer. So what we need to understand here is that people don't just come as a blank sheet of paper that you can write the self-care instructions on. They come with a pre-existing set of ideas about the condition and also fears about what the treatment might be or what the action might take. Also, there are ideas about we have set ideas about certain conditions. What do you think is happening to the guy on the left? <coughs> yeah, most people would say a heart attack. Okay, we did some early work looking at what people experience with heart attacks, and many of them actually don't experience the classic chest pain down the arm. They have atypical symptoms. And 13% expected atypical symptoms in this study of 88 heart attack survivors interviewed in hospital but 93 experienced it. And then we asked people, did your experience match your expectations? And there were three answers, yes, no, or didn't have any expectations. And we grouped them in two groups. If you said yes, or I didn't have any, one group, no was the other group. And we found that that mismatch, where the experience didn't match what they were expecting, was a huge predictor of delay to reach hospital, because they hung about and waited. Now, we do this all the time. We come with a set of ideas about the condition, and if the advice doesn't match that, we say, thank you very much, doctor. I'll go and do it straight away, and then don't. And prototypes can, are also intensely logical, but they can be very mistaken. Okay? So when it comes, these ideas about illness are also important when we decide whether or not to take a treatment. Because in order for us to perceive the necessity of a treatment, our ideas about the problem, the illness, need to match our ideas about the solution. And often there's just not a logical link. I'll give the example of hypertension. Why take this medicine every day when I don't feel tense every day? I, can, I know when my blood pressure's high, I get flushes. Why take this asthma inhaler every day when I only get asthma symptoms once or twice? in the week. The logic of it is very clear, and we kind of don't address it. And, you know, 
these beliefs can actually be changed. Sorry, I'm going to flick through this. This is horrible. It shouldn't really be doing a build. I thought I'd taken that out. Blah, 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 blah. There you go. And <laughs> did you like that? Um, judging uh, the personal need, often what we're talking about is maintenance treatment where it doesn't actually make us feel any better. That's counterintuitive. How do we know when we're ill? We have symptoms. How do we know when we're better? The symptoms go away. Few of us keep taking paracetamol after the headache's gone, only the more cautious. And then we take chances, we miss out doses, nothing bad happens, so it reinforces our idea, I'm not sure continuing with this is really that important for me. And we don't address that. Now, concerns, many people have concerns about medicines, they feel more negative about medicines than those prescribing and administering them. There's research to show this. They take the benefit for granted, and they see them as fundamentally harmful substances that are overused by doctors. This goes back a long way to ancient Greeks had one word for medicine and poison, which was pharmakon. That's where we get pharmacy from. So the idea that all medicines are somehow dangerous. And people seem to think that OTCs are more safe, but that's because they think they're less effective. So we have to couple this idea of things that you can get over the counter actually being quite potent. And once we do, the chances are people will then be a bit more concerned, so we have to address those concerns. Suspicion of pharmaceuticals is linked to a diminishing public trust in doctors and medical science. We see this with you know, rates of MMR vaccination plummeting because there's a spurious report in a minor medical journal called The Lancet, which is then picked up by the Daily Mail. People tend to see medicines with suspicion because they see them as chemical, and there's a great interest in natural remedies. You may have noticed this. This explains it better than any research. Um, this is a magazine called Nature and Health, screaming out at the bottom, how safe is your medication? Then you've got gene ethics, deadly experiment revealed. These are the treatments that people really want. Um, Tibetan gong healing vibrational medicine, and rainforest Viagra. I can see some people nodding. They're obviously effective individually, but don't ever mix them. <laughs> the, the other thing with these is, why is rainforest Viagra more effective than Viagra? Don't answer that question even if you know. But I think there's something serious going on here, which is this idea that medicines don't often look healing, and what people like is the natural, the care. We need to take account of that and how we make explanations. Also, the PILs, the patient information leaflets, are crazy because they list every possible side effect. That's like saying, when you leave the room, you could be decapitated by a slate off the roof, <laughs> run over by a taxi, run over by a bus, just fall down a big well. After a while, you think it's better to stay in here even though you're going to listen to me for longer. And I am I'm almost I'm finished. Almost yeah, I'm almost finished. So, as a th so can we do something about that? And the answer is yes, a simple three-step approach can be effective. Just communicating a common sense rationale for why that person needs that medication, which is, takes account of how they're likely to be thinking about the condition. We can use these insights to make our information more user-friendly, not just in the language, but in the way in which we know that people think about illness and treatment. Uh, we should address concerns and then make it as easy to take as possible. So all of this jazz that I've just been talking about boils down to three simple steps. And there are lots of ways of helping people, you know, reminders, anchoring to daily routines, etc. We don't need to go into it. But actually, when you apply these approaches, as Nick Barber uh, did in a, in a study at the School of Pharmacy, pharmacists can apply these sort of insights in a telephone call. And when you do that, people have more positive beliefs about the treatment, higher adherence, and fewer patients reporting um, medication-related problems. And this is the basis. This study was influenced the new NMS. So, you know, we can do stuff that actually works in practice based on these insights. We're also looking at going beyond the clinic and within the clinic, looking at online support, where pharmacists, you can fill out the questionnaire it goes into a, um, you know, a magic box, and then that feeds back the results to the patient, but also to the clinician or pharmacist. 
which makes the consultation more effective. So we're evaluating these approaches at the moment. We need to look at the question of trust. How much do patients trust the pharmacist as a provider of care in place of the doctor? There's scope uh, for that. But also, how much do they trust the product that the pharmacist is offering? As OTCs get more effective, do people see them as more dangerous? Um, patient choice is not always logical, and we have a tension between handing over the reins to the patient, which is unequivocally good, but also enabling them to make informed choices based on the available evidence, and that's our challenge. It's like with my kids, when I offer them cabbage or broccoli, they say chocolate. <laughs> so you've got to understand what the person's coming with. Finally, patients differ in their desire to be involved in treatment decisions, perceptions in me of medicines and the illness, information needs, and the capacity and resources to follow the advice. And our challenge, self-care is not about just absol absolving the healthcare professional role and handing it over to the patients. It's about understanding what the patient brings and helping them to achieve self-care based on these interventions by tailoring supports to address both perceptions and practicalities. And it means moving beyond the product to actually what we need to add to that product to ensure that the patient gets the best from it. So you have to understand what's in the patient's mind and what motivates them. Thank you very much for listening.